I'm not, I'm not going to hit the brakes and, and uh, no, 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 we're going to, we're going to, we can't stop. We're going forward. There's a place that God, there's a destination just over the ridge that I don't have to see to know that God wants me to go there. I wonder in your life if you stop looking for what's over the ridge. I wonder if you stop believing that God can do more in your life than what's currently happening. Because I can promise you from experience, for those of you that were here on that first meeting in a bus garage, for that first service in a junior high, none of us anticipated what God has done thus far. None of us had a number of 700 baptisms or 500 salvations. None of us had a number like that. None of us believed like that. We just said, God, where do you want us to go? And he took us into it. I'm wondering, are you willing to to walk with him into whatever's next I'm wondering if in your life you can say God I can't stop today and I won't stop today yeah they've told me I can't speak about Jesus here but we're going to go have coffee and talk about Jesus there they've said I can't do this in my workplace but I'll figure out how to have them over for dinner so that they'll know Jesus Christ I need to know that you're going to go with me I need to know that we get to go together I need to know and not only do I need to know heaven needs to know that you're in That you're in it. It's not just this. Well, we went to church. The devil's here every Sunday. Believe me. Like we said last week, we can't stop, church. And we won't stop. That's right. And so this year is going to be a great year. I'm going to ask a a kind of a ridiculous question. And and typically we don't do this as far as feedback, but I'm going to need some help from you. Uh, I I don't want a bunch of people screaming out, but just just speak with me for a second. I want the question is this. What's the most ridiculous thing you have ever purchased in your life? A bird, a bird. I can see that one. Rocks? Somebody bought rocks? All right. What else? Over here, somebody, what's the most ridiculous thing you've ever purchased? Nobody over here bought anything ridiculous. All right. All right, center section. Most, ridi- <laughs> most, most ridiculous thing you've ever purchased right here. What? Say it louder. Slime. Slime. Okay. A what? A zoodler? <laughs> Sis, you're going to have to help me out. What is that for? It makes noodles out of zucchini. Just so you know, sister, there'll be none of those in heaven. So, (laughs) gonna have real pasta on the streets of gold. Praise Jesus. Okay, I don't know if that's biblically true, but I hope so. (laughs) All right. What about this section? Craziest thing, most ridiculous thing you ever bought? Timeshare. All right. Over here, this section. Time, uh, now we can't double up. Most ridiculous. Anybody ever buy a Floby over here? You know that thing where it sucked your hair up and then cut it off? Nobody? Just me? All right. All right. <laughs> no, I didn't. I never bought one of those, I promise. How many of you know sometimes we buy ridiculous stuff? But how many of you know we always like new stuff? How many of you have a flat screen TV in your house? Say amen. amen. How many of you want a bigger one? Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm just glad they keep making bigger ones. I mean, why not? Because we keep buying them, so we might as well make a bigger one. We went into a Sam's Club last week, and literally it was like that angel chorus moment where I walked in, and there I think was an 80-inch one. And I walked in, and it was like, oh. Angels were coming around, and different things were happening. They all wore blue vests. I'm not sure if they were real angels, but you always want something bigger. We like new stuff. I, I'm, I'm a new stuff person. Anybody, anybody an impulse buyer here, say amen. amen. Like, man, it could, say, it could be the same price, but if they put an orange thing on top of it that says clearance, <laughs> we got to show up for it. You know, buy one, get one free. We, man, we're there. We're in it. I'm an emotional buyer. Uh, always been that way. Uh, I'm, I'm just like, if I'm in the moment, and so infomercials and I... It's not a good idea because, like, I'm a pep talk guy. I like, I like pep talks from coaches. I like pregame speeches. I like things like that. So when that guy comes on in the middle of the night and he's on that infomercial and he's like, you can do this, I'm like, you bet I can. Let me call right up now. I'll take two because I got a friend and he's got a friend and they've got three friends and we can figure this thing out down the road. I'm going to be sitting poolside somewhere in just a little while because I'm emotional, so I dive into some of that stuff. It's been a long time since I dove into that stuff. My wife, my wife has helped me in that, not be so emotional in my purchases. How many of you have ever been broke? 
No, no, I mean like broke, broke. Like, you know what I mean? When, like, not ramen broke, but broker than ramen broke. Yeah. When, when Jennifer and I got together, you guys have heard the story where I asked her out, and it didn't, I mean, it went well because she said yes, but I usually stop the story there because it was a really horrible way to ask her out. If no one else wants to, do you want to go out with me? That's an awful way. Fellas, don't do that, okay? <laughs> Chances of it working are really one in a million, and I already got the one. Okay, so it's probably not going to work in the future. But our first date, I was broke. Broke, broke. No car broke. My car was in Nashville, Tennessee. I didn't have any money whatsoever. And so I was like, hey, you want to go out with me? She's like, yeah. So we scheduled the time. I actually asked her if she wanted to go to Branson with me, but I didn't have money, so we couldn't go to Branson. But I wasn't going to cancel the date, so I figured it out. Because when you're broke, you get innovative. Say amen, somebody. Amen. You will make potatoes in ways you did not know you could make potatoes when you're broke. And so I was like, all right, what am I going to do? She said, she knew I didn't have my car. So she's like, hey, you want to drive my car? I'm like, that'd be awesome. Let's, I'll ride with you. What I didn't know at that time was that she had to pay 25 cents a mile for her vehicle. So like every mile she drove, she owed her parents 25 cents. Now, it was a good deal. Some of you are like, what? They made her pay. Yeah, they made her pay because that cared, covered all of her oil changes. She could stop and get fuel. She could do different things like that. But it was 25 cents a mile. Now, for every A she got on her report card, she got 100 free miles. So parents, it's not a bad deal. I didn't know that was the deal. So just for her to come into town and go back home was eight bucks. And so I lived in Midway at the time, and she lived out 201 South. And so she had to come get me. So she spent about $15 just in fuel to come get me. So we get to the place where we're going to go to eat, and I had called a friend, and they were going to eat at Pizza Hut, which was awesome because I knew if I had a friend going, we could kind of double date it, make it less awkward, and I could ask him to pay because I was broke. So we get in this thing, we get to the booth. I look at him, he knows, he gets it, he's going to pay, so he's going to pay. And I said, so what are you guys doing later? And I leaned in real close like a friend would and just kind of giving him that look like, I need to know what y'all are doing because I can't pay for anything else to happen tonight. He's like, we're going to go back to the house and watch movies. I'm like, that sounds like a great idea, let's do that. <laughs> okay, we're going to do that. I said, Jay, do you want to do that, Jennifer, you want to do that? She's like, yeah, we can go do that. Where do you guys live? Where do you live? Theodosia, Missouri. <laughs> So we drove her truck 25 cents a mile to Theodosia, Missouri, and watched Twister, <laughs> the tornado movie. It came on the other night. I had to watch it just for nostalgia's sake. And we drove home, and then I realized that that entire date, I had spent zero money, and Jennifer had spent a lot on fuel <laughs> and stuff, because I was broke. I was trying to come up with some way to get through, because I didn't have any money. We got married. We lived in a little duplex, and both of us working, and, and we still had moments where we didn't have any money. And so sometimes those impulse buys weren't as easy then, but you get innovative. You've got to figure it out. I, I want to talk to you today. We're going to talk about generosity in the church. We're going to talk about giving. Now, listen, here's the reality. Nobody loves to hear this sermon because the church often gets lumped in with TV evangelist. And when the church starts talking about money, immediately people's minds go there. And I want to just walk you through today to understand, our church has a value that says we are generous. We are generous. It's not a question of we will be or we might be. We are generous as a church. Last year, we shut down for three months, two and a half months, from the middle of March to the first week of June. We didn't have in-person services. We came to you online. We did everything we could to keep you engaged in the church, and the reality was we took a hit financially last year, which is everybody did, but I'm not, I'm not stressing about that. But even with all that happening last year, we gave away close to $95,000 as a church because we're generous. We gave that away through benevolence. We helped local families. We gave that away through the Reach Center. We gave that away through uh, tithing. We as a church, we tithe. Actually, we tithe and we give an offering. So we set aside 10%, but we always give more than that. I think last year ended up being like 12.5% we gave away to help plant churches across our nation, to help give in our mission work that we do in Mexico, in southern Mexico, to, to give not only to here, which is valuable to us as a church. We want to take care of our backyard, but the word of God doesn't say stop in the backyard. It says Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. What that would mean in our context is Mountain Home, North Central Arkansas, South Central Missouri, America, and the uttermost parts of the world. 
And so we've done that as a church. We take it very seriously. You also see that we give over and above what we tithe as a church. If you were here at Christmas, you know that we kind of lose our minds a little bit around Christmas times, and we try to buy gifts for everybody. Any kid that needs it, we want to make sure that we take care of them the best we can. People come in and say, hey, I have a need. I'm not going to do Christmas. We just add them in the pile, and we give gifts, and some of you go crazy. You'll get a tag that'll say socks, and you'll walk in with a bicycle and socks. Basketball, a bicycle, and socks, new shoes, books, all these kind of things you do because it's generous. And we all know that you cannot outgive God. Amen? Amen? And so that's a principle of our church. And so if I were to say something to you about generosity, I would just simply say, this is what we do as a church. This is who we are as a church. We're, we're, we're a serving church. We're a generous church. We're an evangelistic church. We, we want people to know Jesus. Corbin, man, Corbin got to be the number one baptism in 2021, and I hope he's just lighting the fire for it to get started. That's who we are. But in order to be a church that is generous, it has to be the people within the church that are generous. And some people may not understand the principles of it, why this is important, because they've been suckered into the whole televangelist. If you send me $100, God will bless you with 1000 Man, those things all sound great. The idea of sowing and reaping in the Bible is very true. What you, a man sows, so shall he reap. But the harvest is not our choice, but it's God's choice. And so it would be wrong of me to go, if you give this amount, then God's going to bless you with that amount. That I, don't, I don't get that say in that. And so I wouldn't do that. God gets to say, if you'll give, this is how I'll bless you. And so today we're going to talk about this is who we are, but we're going to talk about it in the, in the realm of generosity, in the realm of how we give or why we give. Typically, we give out of two mindsets. I'm going to start in the book of Mark. If you have your Bible, Mark chapter 6 is where we're going to be. Mark chapter 6 is a very familiar story. If you know church or been around church in your lifetime, you're familiar with this story. Okay, if you've not, then I'm about to introduce you to one of the coolest stories in the New Testament. So here we go, Mark chapter 6, as we get going, here's what it is. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, this is Jesus, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. The disciples said, hey, it's getting late, Jesus, and there ain't nothing here. Send them away to go get into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy them something to eat. And Jesus answered them, you give them something to eat. Now, I don't know if you've ever planned a meal, but let me give you some context. There's about 20,000 people sitting on the hillside. And the disciples come to him with a perfectly logical thought. Hey, it's getting late, Jesus. People are getting tired. Why don't we go ahead and send them on home? They can go to the countryside, the villages. They can get them some food. And then, hey, if you want to roll this thing in tomorrow, let's do it. That's cool. I'm good. But it's getting kind of late. And Jesus looked at them and said, hey, y'all feed the 20,000. Have any of y'all ever tried to plan on the fly a meal for 20,000 people? It kind of threw the disciples into a, a, a twist here. He answered, you feed them something. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, we have five loaves and two fish. Five loaves, two fish. I don't know if you've ever filleted a fish. But if you have, there's not an enormous amount of meat on a fish unless you have an enormous fish. And especially when you're thinking of 20,000 people, two fish ain't going to go very far. Five loaves aren't going to go very far. Because I don't think we're actually talking about, you know, the Walmart French bread loaf that's this long. That comes with garlic and cheese already in it. No, no, no. This is the base model. This is a kid's lunch. A kid's lunch. So we're talking about Jesus feeding 20,000 people with the equivalent of a Happy Meal. And so the disciples are looking at him pretty confused. But I want you to catch the principle in this one part before we move into the next part of it. There are two different mindsets in regards to how we view generosity. The disciples viewed this, this whole situation from a scarcity mindset. We don't have enough. Scarcity mindset. We don't have enough. I, I've been in situations in my life where all I'm consumed with is that I don't have enough. I don't know, anybody ever got to the end of the month and realized they were way past the end of their money? And you start panicking. You start wondering what to do. Well, here's, here's the scarcity mindset cycle that we run into. No matter what, God provides. 
Whether you're a believer or you're not a believer, everything that we have comes from God. You say, no, no, Pastor Benz, I work for that money. You have the ability to work by the grace of God and that alone. Because it's not anything that we deserve. You don't get to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, and you got to work it out. No, God is gracious and in his grace, he gives us ability. And so God provides the problem is, is once God provides, we have two different ways we can go. Scarcity mindset goes this way. When God provides, we consume it. We consume. Then when we consume, we lack. Y'all ever get to the end of your money and try to think about where it went and you can't remember? Yeah. That's called consuming. You just have consumed everything that you have, all the money that you have, and because you consumed it, you look back and you go, where did it go? What did I do with it? Where is it at? Uh, Dave Ramsey has a principle that talks about telling your money where to go. If you tell it where to go, you'll always know where it went. But too often, we don't tell it where to go. We just consume it rapidly, and then we lack. We don't have enough. And then what happens when we don't have enough? We get afraid. We get anxious. We get fearful. So we consume, we lack, we get afraid. And then, because we are who we are, and when we get afraid, we, enter, we end up reacting rather than responding. I mean, everybody know the difference between a reaction and a response? A reaction, you can't help, it's just what you do. A response has to filter through your brain. And so we get afraid, and then we react. That's why in all the scary movies, they always run upstairs, hide in a closet. Why would you do that? Because they're not thinking. I love that Geico commercial where the kids go hide in a barn full of chainsaws and pitchforks. They're like, maybe we'll be safe in here. Yeah, that's the way it always works out. Because they just reacted. And so since we react, you know how we react? Because we are who we are, we consume more. Any stress eaters in the house? Amen. Yeah. Anybody... Stress shopper in the house? You don't have to tell, you know. <laughs> got, a, got a few that are like, yes, amen, Pastor Ben, that's me. It's a reaction. We get stressed and we got to do something. Well, I'll do something to make me feel better. If I get something new, I'll feel better. But the problem is you got something new to make you feel better, and you got something new with money you didn't have. And so now you're not better. You're just praying for more provision so that you can consume more. You can consume more. And then you lack more, and then you fear more, and then you consume more, and the cycle doesn't stop. That's a scarcity mindset. It's a scarcity mindset. I may not have enough money to get food, but, man, I want to play this video game, so I'm going to go buy this video game. Why? Because it makes me feel better even though I'm starving. I could eat my socks right now. I'm so hungry. But I'm going to consume something that will temporarily fix it. So the other mindset is, the, that's, what, that's where the, the disciples were in this time. We see another scripture where Philip actually pipes up and he says, hey, I got an idea here. Jesus, you're telling us to go feed him. Philip said, it would take more than a half year's wage to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Just a bite. And another one of his disciples said, hey, here, here's a boy. And he's got five loaves and two fish. But how far will that go with so many? They were only looking at what they didn't have. It's a scarcity mindset. And Jesus flipped the script on them. He said, no, I want you to have an abundance mindset. I want you to have this ability to see something bigger than what you are currently seeing. Because right now you're only seeing through a lens this big. And you're missing it. You're missing that you're missing who you got on your side, and you're sitting here only looking at what's in front of you rather than trusting what's always been above you. And so I need you to try to flip your perspective on this, disciples, if you would. Philip, I need you to open your eyes a little bit wider and stop only looking at the fish and start looking at me. Andrew, I need you to stop looking at the bread and then counting the heads. That's uh, If I divide that one loaf by 27, we can feed that two families over there, so I don't know what we're going to do. Stop looking at that and start looking at me and gain this abundance mindset that we're actually working out of an abundance, not because of us, but because of whose we are. 
Because of whose we are. And because of whose we are, we ought to have a different mindset. But let me just tell you honestly, most of the church, and I'm not saying this church, I'm saying the church as a whole, most of the church does not. We still get stuck in a scarcity mindset. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? We don't have enough. We don't have enough. We don't have enough. We don't have enough. And it's such a scary thing because living in the scarcity mindset only leads to fear and anxiety. It will keep you there in regards to your finances. It causes divorce. It causes struggles in a relationship. Finances will do a number on a marriage. Can I get an amen on that? If you live in a scarcity mindset. So God calls us to be abundant. God calls us to do something bigger. Mark or Matthew chapter 14, it's the same story, just a different gospel. But Matthew says it like this. And he says, when it was over, they all ate until they were satisfied. It didn't mean they didn't get one bite. They ate until they were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of leftovers. Well, Matthew in chapter 14 tells us that. So out of this loaves, these five loaves and these two fish, because Jesus' perspective was different, something different happened. And he had to walk the disciples through a different perspective. And so that's my goal today. It's not to, to, to convict you. It's not to harp on you about money. It's to give you maybe the two points, the two principles about generosity. And maybe it'll give you a different perspective on how you handle what God has supplied in your life. How you handle what God has given you. Are you going to have moments of ridiculous? Yep. You are. Yeah, there's going to be something that pops up and you go, ooh, and you have to have it. And you'll probably make mistakes down the road. Lord knows I have. We all have. Okay? But we want to make sure today, if this is who we are, we want you to know why and what drives who we are as a church. So here's where we go. As we get into this, we're going to stay right here in this story. We're just going to keep reading the next text, and we're going to just break it down a little bit. All right? This is the first thing. This is how God multiplies. Because too often you and I think of God in addition. If God would just add to me this, if God would just add to me this. But what you're thinking of is a day-to-day -day mentality. The problem with the day-to-day -day mentality is that is a helps mentality. Is that is, Lord, help me through today. Help me through today. Help me through today. The problem with that is, is that God has our eternity in mind. And God, if he's helping you today, it is not just to help you get to tomorrow. He wants to heal you today so that you're healthy going into your eternity. And so that's where I want you to be. And here's the principles on how we do that. Everything about God. Let me just tell you this according to the word of God. Everything about God is excessive, it's extravagant, and it's always more than enough. Always more than enough. You see, with the bread and the fish, there were 12 baskets of leftovers. They fed another 4,000 men just a few weeks later, or a few days later with these leftovers, and then they picked up more leftovers after that meal with these leftovers. So this five loaves and two fish didn't just feed the 20,000 that day, probably fed close to 15 or 16,000 a few days later, and they still had leftovers. Why? Because God is not a kind of God. He's not a, I'll get you to this point God. He's an exceedingly, abundantly above all that you can think or even ask for kind of God. But it takes faith and trust on our part to experience that, to kind of unlock the door on that. So here we go. First thing, how does God multiply things? Why do so many miss out on an abundant life? Here's the reason. First thing is this, that God multiplies what is blessed. God multiplies what is blessed in your life. You say, well, I don't even know how to do that. I'm about to show it, share you. I'm going to show you in the scripture what happens with it. So Jesus takes they take the fish and the loaves, is this what it says. So they sat down in groups. They sat down in hundreds, and they sat down by fifties. And taking, this is Jesus, taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, he said a blessing, and he broke it. It had to go into Jesus' hands before it could do anything. It had to. That's not my principle. That's a biblical principle. We see this in the book of Malachi. It's the most popular money verse in all of the Bible. Malachi chapter 3. It says, bring the whole tithe to the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And then he says, test me in this. I love this scripture because this is Jesus drawing the line. He says, go ahead. Come on. Try me. Try me. Try me. Most all of you understand what it's like to be dared in the urgency that you want to fulfill that dare because we hate to be challenged and then not step up to the challenge 
Most of you are like that, amen? Or some of you may not be like that, obviously, but I'm like that. If you're going to challenge me, I want, I want to make sure that I can step to the challenge. Here is God, the God of everything, challenging, saying, hey, hey, you test me in this. Try me. You watch what happens. You see that I don't do something amazing. In fact, he goes on to say, and see if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. History lesson. History lesson right here. Do you know the only other time God mentions opening the floodgates of heaven? It's Noah. Noah. So the first time he opened the floodgates of heaven, there wasn't one piece of the earth that wasn't covered, that didn't get saturated by the flood. This time he says, listen, I will open the floodgates of heaven and there won't be one piece of your life that won't be blessed because of it. We've got to trust him. God, I, I want all of heaven to open up. And some people go, well, Vince, so if I give $100, God gives me $1,000. I didn't say that. He's opening up floodgates of heaven. So whatever is, the floodgate is basically like a dam with all this resource behind it, and the floodgate opens and it all pushes through. So what is in heaven? I know you're like, I hope it's dollar bills. I get it. But what's actually in heaven? I want you to hear these things because it's really critical. The undiluted presence of God, overwhelming peace, uncontrollable joy, and abundant provision. That's what's in heaven. And when he opens the floodgate, that's what pours out. That's what comes out. How many of you could use more of the presence of God in your life? Say amen. How many of you would love peace that passes all understanding in your life? Say amen. You all want joy. We all want real true joy to find joy, not just being happy, but I want joy down deep in my guts. That's what I want. And abundant provision, exceedingly abundantly above all that I can think or ask. That's all what sits behind the gate of heaven that God says, if you'll trust me, I'll open it. And I'll pour out so much on you that you won't be able to hang on to it. You will not be able to handle it. And that's what he promises. But we've got to understand that he's calling us to have it blessed. He's calling us to have it blessed. It has to pass through the hands of Jesus. It has to pass through the hands of God. And so where we talk about a tithe, that's where the tithe comes in. That's where we give first to God. And it passes through his hands. And then up to that, we, it's up to us to do with what we have. Second principle, and I want to get into this one because this one's going to be pretty fun, that God not only multiplies what is blessed, but he multiplies what is given away. This doesn't make sense to most people because this is something that we learn from the ground up. So how many of you have ever had kids? Say amen. How many of you realize you didn't have to teach them to not share? Right? I mean, our toddler class is probably dealing with it back there right now. It's mine. It's not yours, it's the church's. But as soon as we take possession of whatever toy it is, it is now mine. No, 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 it's, it's not yours. Well, the moment you try to take it away, what do they say? It's mine. I'm not sharing. It's mine. I want to play with it. You weren't, we'll even do it with things that we're not even using. Things that have sat in the closet for years. Somebody needs it, and we're like, mm, let me think about that. Why? Because even deep in our hearts as adults, minds still exist. And when the enemy tricks us, here's the thing. God doesn't need your money. Please don't think that's what this sermon is about. If God convicts you that way, great. But this is not a sermon about your money. It's a sermon about your heart. Because the selfishness doesn't go away. God just knows that the one thing that we are most selfish about is the thing we take the most pride in. And it's our money. There are money references over 2,000 times in Scripture. He talks more about money than he does faith, hope, salvation, joy, the resurrection, the return. He talks about finances and money more than any of those topics. Why? Because he knew that would be the thing that would want and desire our heart. He says, I want you to live blessed. But in order for that blessing to be multiplied, you've got to learn to give it away. Well, why don't we give it away? 
because it's mine. It's mine. Come here. Come here. Yeah, no, no, behind you. Come here. Come on. I need you. I need you. Come on all the way up. I won't make you talk, I promise, all right? Right here. Come right here. We even got a mark tape right there for you, all right? You good? Can you do me a favor? Hold your hand out just like this. All right. You got any money in your pocket? No. Nope. Okay. So you need me. I'm going to give you some money right there. All right. I'll hold it. Now I want you to hold it like it's yours. Do you see what he did? You did, you did perfect. But did you all see that I didn't have to instruct him how to hold it like it was his? You're like, oh, man, I stepped right in it. Everybody in the place would have done that. If I'd have said, hold it like it's yours, you go, hmm, it's mine. It's mine. And he squeezed it, and he's got it. Now, don't let go of it, all right? All right, good. You're doing good. All right, just hang on to it. Don't let go of it. So now here's what God ends up doing. He says, man, I want to give this to you. I want to bless you. Because, see, in heaven, I got this floodgate that's holding stuff back. I got this floodgate that's just holding stuff back, and it doesn't make any sense to anybody that I would pour all of this out on them. Why doesn't it make sense? Because people are only concerned about what they can hold in their hand. The problem is, if he keeps holding his hand like that, and I come in and go, man, I have all the provision in the world, and I want to give to you. Oh, see, you open your hand too late because you were too busy holding on to what you had. And you missed, didn't you? You miss. You miss, and God's going, I want to give you more, but it, what, I'm not going to waste the resources of heaven by pouring it out on people that won't open their hand. And so you get into this place where God's not helping me. God's not showing up when I need him to. Lord, will you help me with this bill? Will you help me with that bill? And he says, I've been trying. You just won't open your hand. You've been hanging on to what you have instead of trusting for what you could receive. And so he teaches us. He says, hey, if you'll trust me. Do you trust me? You sure? You're a little slow on the answer. <laughs> Have I ever done anything to harm you? No. Do you ever think I would? No. Do you know I love you? Uh, yeah. yeah, you do. You've been around a while, right? I remember when you and you was this big. I could tell that story, but I won't. <laughs> I won't. I won't. <laughs> he said, please don't. <laughs> so you got this in your hand, right? And what God does is do other things. Just hold it right here. God, through other things, goes, hey, I've never hurt you before in my life, in your life. Keep these down. I've never hurt you before. I've always been there when you need me. I have never let you down. And I will show you what I can do if you'll trust me. And what he does is he opens our hand. And then when he reaches in to give, and he says, man, I want to open the windows of heaven on you, and I want you to be able to hold it, you know what? I really want to open the windows of heaven on you, and I, I want you to hold. Did you see what happened? Is that awful? Listen, just as a child doesn't have to be taught to give, someone who lives open-handed won't have to be taught how to live open-handed. Once they're shown that God trusts them, you you immediately saw there was going to be too much, didn't you? And you were like, oh, snap. <laughs> Two reasons why he did that. He didn't want it to hit the floor, but also he knew if he put his other hand up there, guess what? He can hold more. He can hold more. So many of you are missing out because God has blessed you and he has shown you that he hasn't hurt you and he has shown you that he has been there before. He has shown you that he is everything you have ever needed. And what he's asking you to do is to not release something that was already yours. How'd you get the money when you got up here? I handed it to you, didn't I? You're not even holding on to your own stuff. You're holding on what's been given to you by the source. He started empty-handed, just like you and I started empty-handed. And you can push against it. You can say, Vince, God's not worried about my money. You're right. He's worried about your heart. But your heart may own, or your money may own your heart. 
You guys give it up for him. You can take that with you. Hey, is your hand still open? He said, no, I'm holding on to it now. <laughs> Seems silly. Poor change out on the floor. But how much of heaven's floodgate have you missed? Because he just keeps pulling the gate on it going, oh, man. Man, I, I want to wear you out with this. I want to blow your mind with it. I, wanna, <laughs> I just want you to see what I can do for you. So much so that in the New Testament, they talk about it being hilarious giving. That it, that it gets to this point where there's so much joy, and when you get to the place where you can just give it away, that you don't even think about it. Vince, we have to think about it. Yeah, keep living in that scarcity mindset. I'm not saying be ignorant. I'm not saying make horrible choices. I'm saying put God at the front as the best choice. So it's not about money. Why you got money dumped all over the floor? Because it's not about money. It's about selfishness. And Jesus teaches us this lesson in the scripture that I read to you just now. The story, we see that Jesus takes the five loaves and the two fish. He blesses it and breaks it and then hands it to the disciples. Do you know, I think they would have wrote it down. If the moment Jesus prayed, two semi-truck loads of food showed up. But that's not when it happened. It said, and the disciples handed it out. Every time they reach in the basket, they go, there you go. I know there was only two loaves in here to start with, but there keeps being another loaf. So I'm going to hand it out, and i got to reach in again. Here's another lobe, and they kept reaching in and pulling out and reaching in and pulling out. Why? Because God is the one who blesses it, but it's only blessed if it's given away. But I don't want to give because it'll be wasted. I promise you there were some crumbs on the hillside and some fish left. Our concern shouldn't be, what are they doing with it all? We help a lot of people throughout the year, and I wish I knew what they did with it all, but I don't. See, God just told me to be generous. God's called me to be generous, and so you give it away. Not be because my responsibility isn't their choice. My responsibility is my faithfulness. And that's where the difference happens. But I can be faithful. And the reason I can be faithful is because the first verse I read to you, it doesn't mention anything about fish. It doesn't mention anything about bread or disciples or, or an abundance of food. The first verse I read to you said this. It said, and as he came ashore, he saw a large crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. See, it was a lack of selfishness why Jesus landed there in the first place. It was him saying, I need them to see that it's not what they can do for me. Please don't misunderstand the generosity message. We don't give to the church because of what God can do or what we can bring to God or what God asks from us. That's not why I tithe. That's not why we give. We give because God promises to do for us. And I want God for me. And I want God for you in this journey. And so as you walk through this, as you walk through this, this choice, this line in the sand where God says, test me in this. And I know, I know it's not easy. I know it takes sitting down and making a budget and planning it. Sometimes it takes that, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you're like I was at a season. I was so broke, I didn't have, I didn't know how to budget anything. Or why would I? It's hard to budget a buck. No, a dime of it's God's. And I can take you not just to me, but I can take you to people in this room right now that have seen the abundance of God and the blessing of God overwhelm them on 90% rather than living on the full 100%. It's just a true fact. So much so that we've even challenged people in the past. We've said this. We said, if you'll tithe for three months, if you'll tithe for three months, and at the end of that three months, the end of that 90 days, if God hasn't blessed you, I'll give it all back to you. 
I'm not afraid of that challenge because we've had people take it. And they come in and three weeks in, they come in and two months in, they're like, why was I not doing this before? And I said, because we don't trust. We'd rather live like this than to trust what God can do with this. We're going to change the world this year. We're going to. Uh, Because that's what God's called us to do. It may be the world of your kids. It may be the world of of your boss. It may be the world of your teacher. It could be, I don't know whose world we're going to change, but we're going to change the world this year. And I want you to be a part of it. And I want you to jump in and get involved. Your time, your talent. I want those things to be involved in it. But don't neglect the one thing God says, I'll bless you in a way you can't comprehend if you'll be faithful. But you have to let go of self and stay open-handed and trust me with what's in it. I want you to bow with me, church. Father, I love you. And Lord, I thank you so much for your provision. The fact that you are a God who provides. And so, Lord, I pray that today we would become a people that trust your provision. We would become a people that believe that it's not just in the book, but we believe it truly happens. That, Lord, when we are faithful to you, you will be faithful to us in abundance. Because that's who you are. Lord, and if that blessing is good health and provision, then I'll take it, God. If that blessing is joy in my life, then I'll take it, God. If that blessing is peace when all of the world is chaos, then, Lord, I'll take it. But, Lord, if that blessing is the undiluted presence of you in my life, then, Lord, pour it out. Open the gate. Here I am. Open-handed. Take all of what is me and use it for your glory. But not only me, Lord, take this church and all that are within it. Take all of who we are. Take us open-handed and help us change the world. We ask all these things in Jesus' name.